So we've now developed a framework for how we might include science in our understanding of theology and who God is. And I'm going to develop uh, two examples now. The first of these explores the question of where is God in cancer? As an example of tradition, here is Peregrine, the patron saint of people with cancer. His life spanned the, early, the late 13th and early 14th centuries. As you might guess, he contracted cancer of the leg as it happens. Doctors saw amputation as his only option. He spent the night before the operation praying in front of a fresco of the crucifixion and had a vision of Christ descending from the cross and touching his leg. When the doctor arrived, saw in hand the following morning, you've guessed it, no trace of the cancer could be found. Our traditional theological approach to cancer is that it should drive us to pray ardently to God in the hope that the cancer might be taken away. There are undoubtedly records of cancer disappearing in this way after prayers, and of course in people who haven't prayed as well. But most people with cancer do not have this experience. Those who don't have a miraculous healing must wonder how this traditional approach has been helpful to them. Of course, no one in the 14th century had a clue about what causes cancer, but modern science has given us a fairly clear view, as explained in this short video from Cancer Research UK. Our bodies are made up of a hundred million million cells. They're so small you can fit a hundred cells on the top of a pinhead. Most cells have a nucleus, cytoplasm and cell membrane. The nucleus is the cell's control centre and holds the cell's DNA. Your DNA carries all the instructions needed to build your body and maintain its functions. Each instruction is carried on a unique piece of DNA called a gene. Cell growth and multiplication is part of a continual process called the cell cycle. To move through the different stages of the cell cycle, each cell has to go through a series of checkpoints. These checkpoints act a bit like traffic lights and they only give the green light to a cell that's ready to go through to the next stage in the cycle. Only healthy cells are allowed to multiply and so the cell cycle must control which cells are allowed through. The DNA inside cells can sometimes be damaged, either by mistakes in the normal processes in our cells or by things in our lifestyles or environment. Damaged cells are stopped at checkpoints and either repaired or destroyed. But occasionally damaged cells can find a way to sneak through. And sometimes the faulty DNA instructions may tell the cell to multiply at the wrong time or in the wrong place. If a cell accumulates too much damage over time, it can become a cancer cell. They then multiply out of control to form a lump or tumour. This is how cancer starts. To summarise, we no longer need to think of God as causing or allowing cancer in any sense, because we now know that it's caused by a random mutation to one gene in one cell and the failure of the immune system to detect this. Layered on top of this fundamental understanding are a number of known risk factors which might make such an occurrence more or less likely, but don't affect the underlying truth that this is a random event. There are very few, if any, cases of cancer being reported in the Bible. But Jesus was questioned about a man born blind from birth by his disciples who, in keeping with contemporary understanding of diseases, asked what the man or his parents had done to deserve such an affliction. Jesus answered that it was neither, which would be in keeping of our understanding of congenital blindness. So, where do we experience God in our response to cancer? Well, he's everywhere, isn't he? Working within a whole range of individuals, each responding to the cancer according to their personal qualities and their professional knowledge. There are those scientists applying their training to create new knowledge about what causes the disease and how it can be treated. There are surgeons and other medical staff putting that understanding into practice. Then there are those wonderful nurses supporting people through all stages of the disease and family and friends who rally around. Last but not least are the army of ordinary people dressing up in pink, running marathons and half marathons, raising funds and raising awareness and showing solidarity 
with those less fortunate themselves. So how do I make sense of all this? I don't see the God in the cancer itself. My scientific knowledge allows me to see this as a random occurrence. But I do see God in the way that our community responds with such love to those who have cancer. And for this, I want to give thanks and praise.